<laughs> you know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it, it's just. It, it's been a transition that has not been easy, but then again, I didn't know what to expect. And. You know, I wouldn't change it now because when I look at him every day and I, I see me, I see a little me and how fortunate he is is because he has his mother and father under the same roof, which was very important to us. That's why we all moved together. And he also has his big brothers and his sister. So he has, he's gonna have something that none of us have had a stable um, household with people who genuinely care about him and each other and a father who's driven <laughs> driven to provide a good life for us I don't want, I really don't want my son to experience certain things that I experienced and I don't want him to have to suffer Motor City, Old Town, my town as far as I'm concerned. I embody Detroit. Detroit embodies me. Um, I have a lot of respect for the city. Um, Detroit will always be home to me. I consider myself a Detroiter living in Los Angeles. I don't consider myself an Angelino at all. Viola, um, Viola Zakia was her name, Uma. I'm not sure when or who told me that Viola was not my mother. Um, not sure what circumstances, how it came up. But I remember thinking that I was okay with her not being my mother um, because she was not a very nice woman. And surely, you know, it wasn't, Something, I mean, something just didn't click. I mean, I was too young to really try to articulate it or try to figure it out, but just something just didn't feel right about her being my mother. I remember a lot about her and the beatings and just feeling like, you know, there has to be something else. I had no idea that it was a foster home, no idea that it was uh, biological, not my biological family but I just knew that there was something about her that wasn't right. We had other foster children in our home, and I remember one boy was sitting at the dinner table. We were all sitting at the dinner table or breakfast table or whatever. We were all eating a bowl of cornflakes. He had our own individual bowls, and this particular kid, he was sick. Something happened to where he vomited in the bowl of cornflakes, and I don't know if she thought she was, he was playing around or what, but she made him eat the bowl of cornflakes with the vomit in it. And I just remember thinking to myself that there's something not right about that. I had to be like five, six years old. And it was just like, wow. So those are like the memories that I have of her. And she passed away in 1982. So I was five years old. And I remember going to the funeral, but I was, for some reason I was, Relieved. I was happy that day because I knew she wasn't coming back, which was weird. Um, which left me with the father of the home. He was an older guy, older man. He was 74 when he passed. And uh, he eventually went from my foster father to my adopted father. Um, he had four biological children. They were all grown by the time I came around and I never really felt that I fit. And there always seemed to be some resentment towards my dad or towards me because I was around. I always felt that, um, with the exception of maybe one of the siblings. They, laid, they made my life a living hell. Um, they used to tease me. 
you know, make me cry, and then used to question my sexuality when I did it. I mean, they just tortured me. Around 1987, I was 10 years old, there was a situation where uh, my father was accused of sexually molesting kids. Um, the problem with that is that I was one of the kids who was supposedly molested, and that was not the case, but people didn't want to believe that. But what really made it go beyond what it should have been was his own daughter and son-in-law were down on their luck and needed a place to stay. So they, I, I'm assuming they hatched a plan to try to get his house, take his house, take his car. So they used me, being the timid kid that I was, to lie on my father. I almost believed it to where I told the authorities that these things happened because I was afraid of them. And they, not knowing what the consequences would be in terms of my father going to jail and me being taken out of the home, I had no idea. But those things happened. I remember after talking with the cops, it was a Sunday evening, and I remember, I remember thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I'm going home and my father's going to kill me because I did something wrong and I don't know what. But that didn't happen. We were going on the freeway, the same route that we would take home. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I'm gonna go home and it's gonna really be something. But we passed the exit. So then I'm thinking to myself, okay, where are we going? You know, they took me straight to a foster home. And the first of many, and I remember going into that home and they, you know, I met the parents of the house and they, hey, show him his room. They showed me my room. It was a nice room, but it wasn't home. And that was the first time and it hit me like, I'm not going home. And that day, summer of 1987, was the beginning. I want to say it's like June, July, maybe. That began what was six years of being in and out of group homes, in and out of foster homes until I went back to live with my dad in 93 and he passed away a month later. Oh my God. <laughs> this is basically a video about youth in transition that I was shot in when I was 19. That talked about, um, you know, foster kids who were sent into a program where they could live independently, start their lives as adults, paying their own bills, going to college. And I was filmed, or I was featured in this as the I don't know, the poster boy, if you will. Brings back a lot of memories when I look at it. Um, what am I, 36 now? 17 years ago. There's nothing here about me. Oh, I did not like her. Did not like that woman. Oh, this is me when in my first apartment. <laughs> My name is Rashid Umar. I'm 19 years old. I've pretty much been in foster care all my life. Uh, my mother, as I, I heard that my mother had me and eventually just gave me up. And I was placed in a foster home. It's, a, it's, it's been a gradual process, getting a feeling of independence, but everything's going well. And I wish that, you know, I know you can't really change the past, you can only work on the future, but there are certain things I wish I could have changed in my past.
in terms of, you know, just making decisions that would have led me to be more proactive in pursuing things for my, for my career and things of that nature. But, you know, that's just, you know, when I see this video, it just makes me think about all those things and also how handsome I was, goodness. <laughs> terms and um, something that I didn't desire I had no desire of living in simply because I grew up there I grew up in the hood in Detroit and when I left Detroit I wanted to leave the hood behind so for me and then hearing some of the stories of some things that they've gone through over there my thoughts were a I don't want to live there and B I really don't want to raise my son there so if I have to pay a little extra to stay in a decent neighborhood, I figure that's the price I'm willing to pay. But it was tough. I knew it was gonna be an adjustment for everyone because that was a house that they'd stayed in for over a decade. But what I found out was my wife was ready to leave as well. Jordan is a different case in terms of he's younger, he's like a, he's, he's a teenager now. Um, I look at him and I see some of myself at 13 in him. The only difference is he's living at home with his biological mom and his siblings. And I consider him lucky for that simply because I wasn't fortunate to have that. But you would think that someone in my position would be more to him than I have been, and I need to step up and be more for him. Hey, he can't collab, he has a camera, okay? <laughs> get down, go get the ball. No, no, no clapping, get down. Get down, Lib. Get down, Kalib. The way that I found out or noticed about Kalib's development, um, deficiencies or whatnot, was through my wife. She works with special ed kids, so she has a bit of an idea of how to identify these things. And I am definitely not the type of parent to be in denial, because I've seen a lot of parents in denial with their kids. No one wants to admit, and no one wants to have a child that has a special need, but you would do a disservice to them if you don't give them the help that they need, and early intervention is always the best. And, you know, I didn't think anything of it because I'm like, oh, no, can't be that. 
maybe I was just in denial. But then she looked even further into it in terms of getting him tested and looked at by doctors. And it turns out that, you know, he was. He was diagnosed as autistic. And I remember when I found out it was confirmed, I, I, I was crushed because I didn't know, I really didn't know much about autism. And I had a lot of questions like, would he be able to go to college? Or, you know, was he gonna be mentally disabled? I mean, what, what exactly is it? So I struggled with that. And my wife classifies it as me having a breakdown about it. I'm not sure it was that serious, but I really didn't respond well to it. Um, may have went through a little depression on top of the fact that I was unemployed for nine months. My wife's first reaction, she's a very reactive person. So she struggled, or she just instantly reacted as like, okay, well, you know, almost hinting that you can't get a job right now because we don't know what we're gonna do with him as far as a babysitter. Caleb is not able to just go to any daycare. And then you have to consider the financial part of it. How much is it gonna cost? You know, how much is it gonna cost per hour, per month, weekly? You know, what are we gonna do? And that's difficult to consider when you're trying to, I mean, will it cost more because it's a you know, specialized daycare or what? Um, it's been... Through, after being diagnosed, we've gotten some recommendations from the hospital. Um, the Easter Seals has programs where they actually pay partial payment um, towards um, daycare. It's about finding the right one um, that's close by uh, and it's gonna give us the best feeling that, you know, this is where he can go and get the help he needs. How long that's gonna take, who knows? I don't know, my wife doesn't know, so we'll just have to keep plugging away at it. In addition to working <laughs> and me in my school and, you know, supporting the family. You know, but we need to do this and we need to do it quickly. It's moments like this I enjoy. Like when he like sits next to me and he might be watching TV or something. It just makes me feel like, you know, that he wants to be around me. You know, it's like he wants my company. Even if it's just for a few seconds, I enjoy it when he does it. And you know, I hear stories, people talk about their brothers and sisters and the things they have with their families and things of that nature. And that was something that was missing in my life. But it would not have been complete had I not had a, my own child. So I'm hoping for big things for Khalid. And um, I'm just ecstatic at the fact that I have a son walking the earth who's my blood.